All right, everybody, welcome back to the next lecture in the Introduction to HPLC course. So if you missed the first lecture, we went over all of the basics regarding HPLC. So I will leave a link down in the description to that part of the course. And this is the second one in line. What we're going to be talking about in this portion is HPLC columns. So you're obviously going to have a lot of choices when you come to looking at columns for HPLCs. And it is very specific to the type of HPLC methodology you want to run. So if you are interested in a normal phase versus a re reverse phase, uh, those are going to be two different types of materials. And then when you get to an ionic or an ion exchange column, uh, that's again going to be different because of pH changes. So there's a lot of different, um, I guess, finer points that you need to consider with your columns. And I will let you know up front, most of these, uh, when we start talking about columns and different options, the choice is going to seem evident. It's going to seem like you know, well, obviously I would want this over that. And a lot of it's going to come down to cost and the scale that you're working at. So if you are working on a very large scale, perhaps using super expensive materials are not going to be as feasible. You just want a mass purification method and then you deal with smaller batches down the line. Whereas if you want some highly refined technique, if you're doing analytical grade work, then you're obviously going to be opting for the more expensive material most of the time. And a lot of this has sort of evolved over time uh, in terms of what uh, the full range of columns are going to offer. So let's get started by talking about silica because silica is the most common support material you're going to find in HPLC columns, bar none. Um, there are other polymers, uh, polymer resins that can be used. That tends to be more common in ion exchange, and we'll talk about this a little bit more down the road. Uh, that is due to silica being very sensitive to pH changes. So when you have very acidic conditions with certain types of silica columns, it becomes problematic. And then when you have very basic conditions, it also becomes very problematic with breaking apart the silica bedding and basically destroying your column prematurely uh, where you're not going to get good results. All right. So let's talk about silica in the different types of phases. So in normal phase HPLC, you're usually going to have a pure silica column. All right. So that's going to make for a polar column with a non-polar mobile phase. So silica itself, when you're looking at it, it's basically a bunch of alcohol groups that are bound up to a silica backbone, right? A silicon backbone. And so this is very polar when you're dealing with all of these alcohol groups. So we tend to use a non-polar mobile phase because if you use a polar mobile phase, it's really just going to wash everything directly off of the column and you're not going to get any type of retention time. That's useless in terms of separation, right? So when you're dealing with this and we'll draw the structures, you're really dealing with almost a pure silica column or very small modifications. Now, the opposite and the very term reverse phase means the opposite of the normal phase and it was the second one that came from a procedure perspective when this was being developed is reverse phase HPLC. So in a case like this you do have a silica support base most of the time but the silica support base those alcohol groups are kind of stripped away and the they're going to create a uh, silica ethers or silicon ethers and then those silicon ethers are going to have large alkyl chains that are coming off and that's when you hear the term something like c18 when we're talking about something like a c18 column it's referring to an 18 carbon membered chain coming off of those uh silo ether groups um and that is going to be nonpolar, right? So if we have large uh, hydrocarbons, you think of something like a nonpolar solvent like hexane or octane, when you have these super long hydrocarbon chains coming off of your column, that's nonpolar. So it's going to adhere very well to other nonpolar analytes, and the polar analytes are going to get washed through at a quicker rate. And this means we use a polar mobile phase when we're dealing with something like this, okay? So you can see the opposites here, right? The normal phase is dealing with polar column, nonpolar mobile phase. 
And then when we get into the opposite sense for the reverse, we have a nonpolar column. Okay, it's still silica based, but we turn those alcohols into silyl ethers and put these large modifications on them. And then we have the polar mobile phase. Okay, now I briefly mentioned uh, ion exchange HPLC. This is typically, you can find some uh, that are silica based, especially if you know the pH range you're going to stay in is, I'm going to say somewhere between like 3 to 8. Uh, 8 is really the upper limit. It's probably better to be closer to 7, 6. Uh, but it, it's more common to have a resin or some sort of polymer support base with a modified ionic chain. Okay, and this is important in the stationary phase. So instead of just doing these large uh, hydrophobic hydrocarbons, we're going to actually have pretty polar side chains that will deal with the ion exchanging here. All right. So uh, I want to show some examples of this and actually draw it out. Uh, but for instance, and I'm going to abbreviate here, quaternary amines, so an amine that has four basically uh, groups coming off of it, they are very common for anion exchange chromatography. And then when you deal with cation exchange, uh, a lot of times it uses the negatively charged uh, sulfate groups. So you'll have something like a sulfonate, uh, tosylate, those types of things, and you can get the cation exchange. Okay, and this is referring to the actual type of ion that it's going to exchange, right? So if it's cation exchange, a sulfonate group has a negative charge, so we're exchanging cations with the sulfonate groups as the uh, mobile phase moves along. Okay, so just a little bit of terminology there. So let's take a look at this. If we have normal phase, the way that it looks, we have the backbone, which is going to be basically repeating uh, silo ether groups. And then these groups are going to have alcohols coming off of them. And so this right here, these alcohols are what your analytes, as they pass through the column, are going to interact with. Well, this is very polar. So we would expect a strong interaction with other polar analytes and things that are nonpolar are going to get washed along the normal phase columns with relative ease compared to the polar. So then when we come to reverse phase it gets a little more complex in the structure. So we still have the same backbone where we're developing the silo ether backbone. But then instead of the alcohols we create new silo ethers coming off of here. So it's not OH but it's O then you have another silyl ether, okay? These will typically have some short chains. A lot of times it's just methyls that you see on here, all right? And then this is where you find the long chains. So this, for instance, would be a CH2, okay? And let's say it's a C18 column, then it's 17 of those and a CH3, right? And same thing over here, it's going to be just for the sake of room, I'm going to write this one, CH2, right? And the idea is that you get these repeating groups like this. Now, this is important because sometimes due to steric hindrance, meaning large groups coming together, you cannot cram all of them in uh, these individual portions. So you leave gaps sometimes. And a lot of times these gaps have to be covered up with something else, a smaller group. And this is something referred to as end capping. So we're going to get to that later in this lecture. But end capping your column is taking these spots that were missed because of large steric bulkiness and basically tucking maybe little t-butyl groups or something like that in there that still offer some level of uh, hydrophobicity but do not have nearly the amount of steric encumbrance as uh, these other groups do, all right? And then for something like ion exchange, okay, a lot of times you'll have your resin is sort of, and I'm going to divide this in two for the cation anion, uh, you'll have like aromatic groups that are sort of bound here, okay? And then with these aromatic groups, you'll end up with your whatever's going to be doing the ion exchange. So we said, right, for the cation exchange, we can have sulfonate groups, so something like this, and then you would see that repeated. So this is the general setup that you would expect to see. And then as you've got your analytes passing, right, 
Obviously, an analyte that has a positive charge is going to adhere better to the negative charges, whereas something with a negative charge is going to go and pass right on through. And then your buffer would also usually have salts of differing, uh, you know, positive or negative charges, depending on the solution you're in, that help to sort of wash these or kick them off, right? So like, let's say that there's a positive analyte here, then your buffer could have a positive charge and it comes along and kicks this one off to the next sulfonate group. And then the buffer ion is here, right? We're exchanging ions. That's the whole name. It's ion exchange. And based on how well these adhere to these uh, negatively charged groups, you're going to have different retention times. And that's the whole goal of HPLC is you want different retention times and good separation, right? So again, uh, I mentioned that we can have quaternary amines. So something just as simple as okay, CH3. And if I had uh, three of those on here, that would make a positive charge on that amine. Sorry, that's hard to see. And then I'll draw one more here. Okay, so this is the general premise of these columns. And let's actually draw the methyl groups out this time. These columns contain uh, some sort of ionic group. And they are used for exchanging other ionic analytes that come through. So a very common use for ion exchange is going to be amino acids. And that's because amino acids have both the carboxylic and the uh, amine portion. Those are very pH dependent in terms of the charge they're going to take on. And then a lot of the side chains also have the potential to hold charges, right? You have side chains that uh, contain carboxylic acids, they contain amines. So you have lots of different separation going on between neutral amino acids, positive or cation amino acids, and then anion amino acids. And ion exchange is a very good use for that. So now let's start to talk about some of the other uh, important factors here. So what we want to talk about first here, and again, a lot of these tend to be, there's an obvious choice, but you do have to consider costs, especially depending on your lab, what sort of financing you have for these projects, okay? Silica particle shape is very important. So it can either be spherical or it can have an irregular shape. And when it's an irregular shape, it can be anything from like a crescent to sort of a semi half circle. You can get all sorts of different weird shapes, right? Now, when you start looking at this, in general, the spherical silica shape is going to be a better choice for your packed column, okay? And this is important because you get better stacking. So if you look through the column, okay, that you have set up, when you have spherical silica and it's all the same diameter, it stacks very nicely on top of one another, okay? And that provides a very even flow for the mobile phase. And good flow, constant flow, is very important for HPLC. So one of the parameters that we always set up in our methods for HPLC is flow rate. And when you're dealing with your flow rate, it's how much mobile phase is going to be delivered through the column, usually per minute, but at some rate. And you need to make sure that that is consistent, right? The pumps in your HPLC help with that, but you have to have a column that's got good integrity in order to keep a solid flow moving through that. Now, on the other hand, you can have an uneven mobile phase flow when you've got these irregular particles because they don't stack the same way that the nice spherical ones do, okay? And when you get something like this, you still have decent flow, but the problem is, is that it's not always going to be even, and that can become very important when you have compounds that resolve very close to one another. So if you've got something that, let's say, has a retention time at uh, 18 minutes, and then the next thing has a retention time at 18.1 minutes, right? If those two are close together, you need as much resolving power as possible. And in order to do that, you cannot have sort of uneven flow at certain parts of your column. All right, so 
why do we talk about the difference? It seems like spherical is the obvious choice. Well, spherical is more money. Now, most columns on the market for HPLC analytical grade are going to be spherical uh, nowadays. Okay, you get better stacking and even mobile flow phase. So what about this? Other than the fact that it saves you money, you have the poor stacking and the uneven mobile phase. Why would you go with something like that? Well, money is one thing. And then as a, I mentioned, there's some other things that are important. And one of them is the scale at which you're doing this on. So if you're going to do an industrial scale purification, you have a whole huge batch of this material and you don't need it to be 100% perfect, then this could be an option that is acceptable for you, especially if you're getting into large cost. It would be very painstaking to take tiny amounts if you're an industrial size scale and try to put it through the HPLC to purify milligrams at a time. You want to be doing gram, kilogram loads, okay? And that kind of leads to the next point, which is, this is very well suited, the irregular is very well suited for benchtop or flash column chromatography type of material because you usually, uh, you've got a much larger column uh, when you're doing something like a flash benchtop uh, chromatography than you would for HPLC. HPLC columns are very small in comparison to your tabletop columns and you can get away with uh, basically the number of what's called theoretical plates, the number of times that your compound binds and then loosens and then binds and then loosens to your stationary phase is going to be magnifold higher when you're doing your benchtop chromatography versus your HPLC. And that makes a difference because if you're going to have sort of the cruddier silica, you need to have a whole lot more of it in order to capture the separation properly. You get more theoretical plates out of it, okay? So let's talk about a couple other things here. Now that we have the shape of the particles, we wanna talk about particle size. So most HPLC columns are going to range from three to 10 micrometers in particle size. Sometimes it's called microns, all right? So three to 10 micrometers, that's not very large. Now. What happens if you go below that or above that? If it gets too small, it can lead to pressure buildup. So when you get really refined and you have very, very tiny, keep in mind the tinier the diameter, the tinier the particle size of the silica, the better it's going to stack together. So sometimes that's good. We want good stacking. But you have diminishing returns where at a certain point, it almost becomes too difficult for the mobile phase to flow through because it's so tightly packed and that can lead to high pressure buildup and you don't want high pressure buildup on your instrument, okay? And then what happens if you're on the other end? If you go past the 10 micrometer, at that point you're starting to get too large and that can lead to poor resolution. That goes back to sort of the irregular shape, right? If I have poor packing or poor stacking of the silica because they're so large, then what's gonna happen is it's not going to basically have the proper number of theoretical plates. I'm not going to get good resolution. Uh, so a lot of these peaks are going to uh, broaden. They might end up clustering together more and they're gonna have poor retention time as they try to get washed through. Okay, so particle size is important. We wanna usually try to stay within that range. Okay, pH. Now, if you remember at the beginning of this lecture, we said pH is going to be important, uh, specifically with silica columns. So many analytes are going to contain charges at various pH levels. Now that's depending on pKa. So if you need a refresher of that, just open up a general chemistry or biochemistry textbook. You can look at Henderson Hasselbach and stuff of that nature. Okay, the pKa is really going to determine whether something is in its ionic state or its neutral state, okay, when it's going through. And usually it's a mixture of the two at a given pH, right? Because we have a ratio of what's neutral versus what's deprotonated, unless we're dealing with something like a strong acid, right? So this should always be considered when you're developing HPLC methods, especially when you have to use buffers and things of that nature. So it becomes very important when using ion exchange HPLC because when you're dealing with ions, you, those are going to be pH dependent most of the time because ions are usually acids that have been deprotonated 
or bases like an amine that has been protonated at a lower pH. And so when you start dealing with a lot of these um, ionic forms, you have to be very aware of what pH you're running at. Okay, now what about column stability? Okay, so the column, uh, the silica based column specifically, you need to be aware of your pH ranges. So if the pH is too high, and we're going to classify this around 8 or above, then the problem is that the silica support, the actual backbone, the silyl ethers, is susceptible to base hydrolysis. And that can break apart the actual silica basing, and it will start to corrode the column uh, as you pump through the uh, higher hydroxide content, the base content. Now, what happens on the opposite end? If the pH dips too low, meaning we're getting into highly acidic territory, uh, anything less than two, then the problem is you can have all of those bonded stationary phases in the reverse phase. So like the C18s, those types of groups, they can undergo acidic hydrolysis. So hydrolysis can be both acid or base driven. Uh, with the acidic hydrolysis, these large functional groups that you are putting on your reverse phase columns can be stripped away from the silica support and you obviously don't want that because a reverse phase column no longer becomes reverse phase if you're stripping away all of the hydrophobic portionalities that are basically you know edited onto there so the ph is very important and even more so when we're dealing with silica support all right, so now that we've discussed pH, let's talk about the next important thing, which is how the alkyl chain columns for reverse phase are actually prepared. Okay, now you're going to see a lot of this is centering around reverse phase, and that is because reverse phase is usually the first one that most people go to for their method developments. It's one of the most common types. It is by no means the only type. Uh, but reverse phase tends to be one of the preferred methods. So you'll see a lot of things talking about reverse phase when you're dealing with columns. So there are two different ways uh, that we can, there's actually three or four, but there's two major ways that we can prepare alkyl chained columns. And that is we can either do a monomeric functionalization or a polymeric. Now, when I said there's multiple uh, polymeric, you could have like a dimeric or a trimeric. It usually it doesn't go above trimeric. Okay. So what does all of this mean? Well, when we turn around and we get ready to add these groups, okay, to the reverse phase. So keep in mind that we've got something going on like this as the backbone. Okay. And then we have these groups with the alcohols, right? So if you take a look at this, these groups right here are known as silanol groups, okay? So it's a mixture between silica and alcohol. And when we want to make edits, let's say that we don't want a normal phase column, we actually want one of these uh, reverse phase columns, what you'll usually do is you'll take whatever you want to add. Again, we'll stick to C18 for this current example. So I've got 17 of these. And then you'll usually use some sort of, uh, remember I said the other silica portion is like two methyl groups and a chlorine. Okay, so all of this reagent right here is used and when it's applied you end up getting these large backbone edits that look like this so you've got O right and then SI and then you've got right your long chains there so that's the hydrophobic portion so a monomeric functionalization means that for every single one of these, we are attempting to add this functionality, okay? So it's a one-to-one -one ratio here. When you start dealing with polymeric functionalization, okay, it's the same sort of backbone. So you're going to start off with the same standard silica, 
But the key here is that you are going to attempt to do more than one with each of these additions, meaning that you will have one of these uh, hydrophobic chains added to more than one of the silanol groups. So in a case like this, let's show a dimeric, okay? You would have your group. So again, we'll do a C18. So this is CH2, there's 17 of those plus the CH3, right? And then we have the SI, two of these guys. And then, uh, actually, I'm sorry, it would be one of those in this case, so scratch that, because we need two of the chlorines, because we're going to try to attach it to more than one. So every time we do this, the alcohol will displace or pop one of the chlorines off as a leaving group. So what you end up with is something that looks like this. I'm going to do my best artistic work here. You end up with something that looks along the lines of this. Okay. And you've got one of these groups for two of these portionalities right here. Okay, now you can go up to three of them. So if you do three of them, that's usually where it maxes out. You can't do more than three silano groups per uh, hydrophobic chain. Um, but the polymeric is the one that is preferred by far. And the reason that we want the polymeric functionalization is that it's usually going to have better stability at lower pHs. So it's going to be stable at lower pH. And we just got finished talking about pH and saying we have to be careful because these groups, right, these larger groups can get stripped away if we have too much acid content there. So when we have multiple of these uh, siloether linkages per one hydrophobic chain, it tends to lead to greater stability at lower pH, and it also tends to make the uh, groupings more hydrophobic, okay? Specifically the, these uh, silica backbones, because when you do that, when you, we're, we're about to get into end capping here, but what happens is when you do that, right, if it's only every three, it's very easy to put one of these every three silica backbone groups, right? That's better spaced out. Whereas trying to put one of these every single one, this creates a lot of steric problems. And when you get into steric problems, you need to end cap in order to avoid having pockets of these types of material, the silanol groups left over. So you're improving the uh, hydrophobicity uh, or how hydrophobic it is. It's going to be more hydrophobic. Okay, and the goal of the reverse phase column is to be hydrophobic. That's what we're looking for. So when you do this polymeric uh, formation, it helps to stabilize the column and it helps to make it more hydrophobic. And that's exactly what we want in a reverse phase. All right, so now we're going to deal with end capping. Okay, we've kind of talked about this. Uh, many reverse phase columns have gaps in the alkyl application, and that leaves open uh, silanol groups. So we just talked about that up here. So what happens is when you start piling these up one and one and one, right, at a certain point, they become too sterically hindered. And when you're trying to make these applications, it'll skip over one. And the problem is that that's going to leave a situation like this. So you'll have something like this. Right, so if I have one of them here, and then I have one of them over here, it becomes very sterically hindering to put this one in the middle. And so a lot of times what you'll see is that the chemical process or the synthesis of these columns, it just skips over this and it leaves this here. Well, if the goal is to buy a reverse phase column, which wants these non-polar 
proportionalities or material, this is highly polar. So this is not good. This is going to affect your retention times because you have polar functionalities that are kind of sparsed in throughout the nonpolar. And that becomes a problem. So it occurs due to steric factors like we saw. And it is solved by using smaller steric molecules that can cover up and get in to these silano groups where the larger ones may have not been able to do that. Okay, so one of the issues with this is it can cause peak tailing. So when you have a peak in your HPLC, right, you're going along, you've got a good one, and then maybe there's something that gets affected by this. And so what you see is sort of this long, right, elongated, something like this, instead of a nice peak. And so when you end up with this tailing phenomenon here, a lot of this will be due to the fact that you do not have your end capping in place. So end capping helps to fix this and create very nice peaks. Okay, so you have to consider, are you going to purchase a column that is end capped or one that has the silano groups exposed? All right, so the last thing we're going to discuss in this lecture is the choice of the reverse phase stationary material. So what we're talking about here is when we get into a reverse phase HPLC, you have a lot of different options. So the one that we keep sort of throwing around here is C18, and that is by far the most nonpolar of the options that are on the market, unless you really have some specialized column made specifically for you. Uh, C18 is widely available and it is considered the most nonpolar option. All right. Now, after that, the next one in order ranking is usually going to be a C8 column. So that's going to be one that is not nearly as polar as, I'm sorry, not nearly as nonpolar as the C18. It's definitely more polar. Okay. And then we have C4. C4 is going to be just three of these CH2 groups and a CH3. That would be a C4 column. And then you can have things like just methyls that are attached. And then you can actually start putting on some level of polarity. So you can have nitriles. You can have phenyl groups. Okay. And you can have, as crazy as it sounds, amine groups. Now, people think about this and they say, well, reverse phase is supposed to be nonpolar. Well, it's nonpolar relative to normal phase and normal phase is using a bunch of alcohol groups from silica. So relatively speaking, an alcohol is still more polar than an amine group. So these are increasing in polarity, right? As we go down, however, these are all still going to be considered nonpolar relative to the alcohol. So if I were to draw the pattern here, okay, we're talking about polarity of the reverse phase is going to increase going down this way. And then what we want to consider on the opposite end here is an increase of retention time, which I'm going to abbreviate RT, for nonpolar analytes. Okay, and analyte being what you are actually analyzing. So that should make sense. We talk about the polarity is increasing as we go down. So C18 is going to be the most nonpolar of the bunch. It's at the top. And that means with the C18 column, the most nonpolar analytes are going to have the highest retention times. So that's the way that this mixing and matching goes here. Okay. And the larger the difference in stationary polarity, the more drastic the retention variance is going to be when you look at something like that. So you can see some difference between a C18 and a C8 column. You'll see an even bigger difference between a C18 and a C4 column. All right, and there's still a difference between a C8 and a C4 column. So what most people do is they start out with C18. They see how it looks. 
and then they will adjust their mobile phases accordingly. And we're going to get into that more in each individual type. So we're going to have a lecture on reverse phase, a lecture on normal phase, etc. So as you implement your column, the first thing you want to do is start playing around with your mobile phases. And if you can't get good separation with that, then maybe you need to try a different column. So maybe you need to try C8 or C4. Now, the reason that you don't start with columns is because columns are extraordinarily expensive compared to mobile phases. So most mobile phases for reverse phase chromatography are going to be water and some relatively cheap organic solvents. Uh, the most common are methanol and acetonitrile. So getting a bottle of methanol and acetonitrile and then playing around with different concentrations is far more affordable and worth your time versus having multiple columns uh, that can run several thousand dollars each and then playing around with them and seeing what works best, okay? So if you really can't figure it out with your mobile phases and some other techniques, you, you know, temperature, pH, things of that nature, then maybe you want to look at a different column and see how that looks, all right? So that pretty much wraps up what we're going to talk about here. I think this is good. We're closing in on 40 minutes. I don't want to go much longer. So that is column chemistry for HPLC. And hopefully you have a broader understanding now of all the things that can go into a column, what makes a good column, what would make a column less desirable. All right. I think the next thing we're going to do, because you can see the prevalence of it here, is we will do a lecture on reverse HPLC methodology and everything that goes into that, including mobile phases, uh, the more details about the column and stuff like that. So this was an overview of column chemistry, uh, a lot of it being reverse phase because that's the most popular HPLC method by far. And we will wrap it up there. And I will see you guys for the next lecture where we will take on reverse phase HPLC. I hope everybody has a good rest of the day. And as always, thank you for learning with us.